With an initial investment of around $500, is it possible for you to start off on your journey as a blacksmith with the basic tools, equipment, materials, supplies that you need not only to learn basic forging skills, but even to make a product that you can sell to recoup that initial investment and even take it a little bit further, have a little bit of money to reinvest in the craft, buy some more tools, and more importantly, buy some more materials so you can keep going. That's what I wanna find out, and today we're going to start by looking at the basic tools, forge, anvil, hammer, tongs, where you can find these things for a price that's within that $500 budget, and even buy the materials you need to get started. Our sponsor for today's video, Vivor, has sent us a small single burner forge, and this is going to be the heart of our budget blacksmithing setup. This little forge comes with pretty much everything you need except for the propane tank and the propane to run it on. There's the forge body that's already assembled, already insulated with kaolin, burner, the jet with an on-off valve, regulator with, with a hose to run it off of, a fire brick to the bottom, and some refractory cement and a brush to apply it with. And this is the first thing we have to tackle setting this forge up. The ceramic fiber that's used to insulate a forge like this is really bad for your respiratory health if it's not sealed up some way. And that's what the refractory cement is for. We'll mix this up, paint it on the inside of the forge, let it cure overnight, and that seals it up so you don't have to worry about those fibers getting in the air where they present a respiratory hazard. This is really important with any forge that has exposed ceramic batting like that, KO wool, Insa wool, whatever the product name is. You should always seal it up, and Beaver provides the materials to do that. Now make sure the insulation doesn't poke into the burner here. Trail that back a little bit. The assembly on this little forge is super simple. Burner goes in, it has a set screw to keep it in place. The hose attaches to the valve which already has the jet pre-installed and then it connects to the propane tank. Now there is no gauge on this so you just have to judge gas pressure based on how the forge is burning, and I think that won't be too bad. Gauge is nice, but once you're used to the way the forge performs, I don't think it's really that big a deal. I'm doing a real quick leak check, I put pressure on the hose, closed all the valves at the tank and the forge, and then I'm just going to let it sit. If I come back and open the valve at the forge, and there's still pressure in the line, there's no leak. Soapy water in a squirt bottle is a real good way to check for leaks as well. Just squirt a little bit on each fitting. If you get bubbles coming up, you have some kind of a leak. And of course, propane is odorized, so it's got that very distinctive smell of mercaptan. And as long as you're paying attention, you'll probably be able to recognize whether or not you have a leak. Now, Viber did actually send a second forge, a two-burner version of this, and at some point we'll do a comparison and talk about why you might want two burners versus one burner. Basically, it's just longer heat. One burner should get just as hot for the smaller volume as two burners does for the larger forge. But we'll compare these side by side later. To test my theory on setting up shop for around $500, I really wanted to feature the single burner forge that is a little bit more affordable. There are no obvious leaks in this system, so I'm going to go ahead and light the forge. I frequently use a torch for this, but if you're on a budget and don't have a little propane torch, you can light a piece of paper with a match, put that in the forge, and then light the forge. I wouldn't put my hand close enough to this holding onto a match. If I can get anything to burn anyways. We had some rain lately, everything is really humid.
that really isn't too bad. It took about 10 minutes for that to come up to heat initially. And it's still heating up, so subsequent heats of material are going to get a little bit faster. And I certainly don't have this turned up all the way. Unless you're trying to forge weld, I don't see any point in it. And we'll do some more forging in this before the video is done. And maybe I'll try a simple forge weld just to see if this will reach that kind of temperature. But before we do that, I'd like to cover the rest of the tools, the supplies, the materials that I'm including in this $500 budget, at least at this point. Things are liable to change before we get through with this process, and it may take three or four videos to truly test out the theory. Now obviously, once you have materials hot, you need to be able to work those materials. So the next most important thing is going to be an anvil. While there are lots of ways you can use makeshift anvils, a big sledgehammer, a large chunk of steel, an old piece of railroad rail, an actual anvil is going to make your life a lot easier. And the little 30 kilo or 66 pound Asayo anvil that Vivor sent us for a previous video really isn't a bad way to go. It's a perfectly functional anvil. It's just kind of small, kind of light, and it has a few little issues that make it less than ideal, like the round hole that should be a Pritchell hole is down on the horn where it's really just a place to run a socket extension through so you can bolt it down to a stump. I don't really see that as a deal breaker. The hardy hole is about the same size so you can still punch through into the hardy hole. And if you haven't seen the video I did on that little anvil, I'll link to it right up here. Oh, as far as prices go, this little single burner forge will run you about $90 and that includes shipping here in the U.S. The two burner version of it is about $130. That also includes shipping. So that's a pretty good deal. And the little anvil is $123 from Beaver, and again, that includes the shipping cost. The next thing you're going to want is a hammer. Depending on your strength and how comfortable you are with hammering, something between one and two and a half pounds is probably about right. Anything heavier than that at this point is really overkill, and I don't think you need to go to three, three and a half, four pounds. It's also a good way to give yourself repetitive use injuries or blacksmith's elbow. Now I went online and I went to Blacksmith Supply and I bought a hammer and some tongs. This is a thousand gram hammer, so that's 2.2 pounds, just under two and a half pounds. They've got it in different weights if you want a little lighter hammer because you're not used to swinging a hammer. They have those too. This hammer only runs something like $29. That's a real bargain for a pretty good hammer. You can also find hammers on the used tool market or use what you already have if you have a one and a half or two pound ball peen hammer. Heck, you can even work with a claw hammer, although that's not ideal. I also picked up a pair of tongs. These ran about 35, but I ordered a size smaller than I should have. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna order a larger size, and I think that will fit better. Now truthfully, I have all sorts of tongs around the shop and I don't need to buy more tongs. I just wanna try out the tools that are actually within the budget that I'm setting here and make sure they're worth owning. So these are a nice little pair of tongs. They're nothing special, but they're ideally sized for quarter inch material. And I'm gonna be working with 3 8 for most of this plan. To run this forge, you're gonna need propane. I'm running it off of a 20 pound cylinder. Some forges will draw propane fast enough that a 20 pound cylinder will start to ice up and it won't vaporize and provide fuel fast enough for the forge. I think a single burner forge of this size won't have that problem, but that's part of what I'm testing out here. And I'll have some recommendations later on how you might be able to prevent that, and some other size propane tanks that might be a better option in the long run anyways. Now if you have one of these on your barbecue, you can certainly borrow it off the barbecue, take it in, get it filled wherever you fill it normally, and you're all good to go. If you have to buy a tank, around here they're running about $59 for a brand new propane tank. The fill cost me about $17. You can also go through one of these propane exchange places, but I think that's about $22, $23 around here. So it's a little bit more money to do the exchange a tank plan, and it's probably a better deal in the long run to just own your own tank, go to a propane place and get it filled. Of course, that's going to vary depending on where you fill the tank. If you're going to a propane dealer, the people that drive the big trucks and go around rural areas and fill tanks for the house, which we have several of in our area, that's going to be the best deal. If you go to the local rental center or gas station that happens to fill propane tanks, they're probably going to cost more money and maybe the exchange deal becomes a better deal at that point. It's hard to say for sure. You're just going to have to do a little shopping around. 
you're going to need some way to cut material. Just starting out, a hacksaw is probably the best option. If you own an angle grinder and put a cutoff disc in it, that's really a good way to go. But if you're starting on a budget, a hacksaw is not too expensive. You can find real cheap ones at some place like Harbor Freight for six or seven dollars. You can find used ones at garage sales, sometimes as cheap as 50 cents or a dollar. Or you can buy a really nice hacksaw frame for 45 or 50 dollars just up to what you want to spend. If you're going to use a hacksaw a lot, the nice frame is the way to go. But you can still get a decent hacksaw frame brand new like this for around $20. You'll also need blades. 18 tooth bimetal blades are probably the way to go. Buy them in a pack of half dozen or a dozen, something like that. And that should last you quite a while, unless you're cutting hard materials. Try to avoid that with a hacksaw. They're not meant for that. Now sometimes you'll need to knock a burr off after you've cut material or if you're forging and things aren't quite as clean as you'd like. Grinder's really an easy way to clean that stuff up. Most people starting off on a budget don't have a grinder, so a file, an eight or a 10 inch, half round bastard file with a handle, always put handles on your file, is really the way to go. And again, depending on where you buy this, you might be able to do it as cheaply as $6. Those files aren't gonna last as long, or it might cost you 20 or $30 for a name brand file. Unfortunately, even the name brand files aren't as good today as they used to be. If you can find new old stock files that were made in the U.S., the old Nicholson's, which is what this is, but even a new, brand new Nicholson or Simmons file will get the job done, and probably the ones from Harbor Freight will too, although I've never actually tried one. suppose I'm going to have to go buy one just to try it out. Now trying to hold something just across your knee or flat on the anvil while you're using a hacksaw or a file is really problematic. You're going to want something to hold stuff in. A bench vise is the ideal thing for that. A leg vise is great in a blacksmith shop and at some point you're going to want a leg vise. But if you just need a vise to use a hacksaw or a file, small bench vises are available and they're affordable. You can get little vises this size. This is about a three inch vise. We went to various antique stores the other day and I saw these ranging from $25 to about $150. The $150 one was the one that was the most beat up and in the worst shape. And the $25 one looked plenty serviceable. eBay is full of these things at all sorts of price ranges. The bigger, the heavier the vice, the happier you're going to be with it. Getting a little two inch vice that they often call a jeweler's vice probably isn't the best, but it would also probably get the job done. Now, Vivor does sell a four, four and a half inch vise, I think. Runs about $40. Brand new vise, and if you're buying a forge and an anvil from Vivor, that might just be the way to go. You'll need to mount that vise to some sort of a solid surface. Worst case, you mount it to something like a 2x10 or a 2x12 that sits on the ground and you stand on it while you bend over and saw. That's going to get miserable fast. Better option is some sort of a workbench. If you don't have a workbench already, you can probably build something simple with some boards across some sawhorses. I've built a little bench in this shop just to get me by temporarily with some scrap wood on cinder block legs. Really not a bad bench, not the best thing in the world. The top slides around a little bit, but it's a lot better than working on the ground. And that then brings us to a discussion of materials. As I mentioned, we're going to do most of this with 3 8 bar. I think that's a good size to start with. Not too heavy, forges pretty easily, but it's also not so small that you're going to screw it up really fast with a missed hammer blow, or it's not going to cool off so fast to the forge that you're losing heat almost instantly when you go to the anvil. I buy from a steel supplier. Most bigger towns or cities will have some kind of a steel supplier and it pays doing a Google search to find out what's in your area. If you can't find anything, maybe go to the local welding shop, ask them where they buy their steel. Now I buy this in 20 foot pieces. I had them cut it in half for me so I could throw it in the back of the pickup truck to get it home. It cost me $13.30 per piece of material. I bought two, so that's $26.60 for the two pieces of material. Now you can buy this at a lot of the big box stores and the home centers. But there it's going to cost you more like five or six dollars for a three foot piece and that gets to be a lot more expensive than buying it from a regular steel supplier. Now somebody right now is thinking, isn't rebar the ideal thing to start with? In my opinion, it is not. It's a little bit cheaper than this, not a lot cheaper, but rebar tends to be a medium carbon steel. 
it's going to be harder to forge. If you need to quench it to cool something off to get a controlled bend or keep from messing up a little curl on a hook or something like that, there's a real good chance you're going to harden it and then it's going to break. So that's a real downside to rebar. You also have to deal with that texture. If you like the texture, that's one thing, but if you're trying to make nice, smooth, clean work, you got to work all that texture out and you're just making your life miserable in the long run. Now you're also going to have to deal with cutting rebar. Because it's got a higher carbon content, it's harder to cut with a hacksaw, harder to file, your hacksaw is going to wear out, you're going to go through more blades, and in the long run it might cost you more to use rebar than it does just to buy mild steel in the first place. If that's all you have, go for it. Don't let not having mild steel deter you from getting started. But in my opinion, rebar is just going to make your life more difficult. When I ordered from Blacksmith Supply, I bought one other thing. It's a 12-inch piece of half-inch diameter S7 tool steel. S7 is a good steel for making punches and chisels. We'll at least need to make a punch, and we'll look at that in an upcoming video. But this is a pretty good option. It is tough to forge, but it is also air hardening, so you don't need to worry about a lot of complicated hardening and tempering procedures. So I think this isn't a bad way to go. We're going to try it out and see what we get out of it. These are going to be lightweight, simple tools. Half inches, really small stuff. But for what I've got in mind, this is a good place to start. That's probably not a full list of tools. Like I said, you're going to need some sort of a work surface. You're probably going to need a bucket to cool things off if your tongs get hot. Or if you accidentally grab something hot and need to cool off a burnt hand, you need to get that down in water to cool it off. At some point we're going to need some kind of finish, some wax, some oil, something like that to put on the projects we're working on. And I'll talk about those things and what those cost as we get to that point. But for now, I'm still under that $500 point for all the stuff that I've talked about so far. So I think we're in good shape to stay on budget. The other thing is a workspace. And that's something that really is about safety. You can work outside as long as you're not going to start a fire. So working on a concrete patio out on a driveway, something like that, probably isn't a bad option. Working in bright sunlight can be kind of problematic. But a lot of people do that, and you can get by that way. This little shed has a dirt floor. I don't have a bunch of combustible storage in here. So I consider this a safe place for me to work. If you're working in your garage, just make sure you get the combustible storage out of the way. And by all means, take the gas cans, leaky lawnmowers, chainsaws, things like that out. Get them out of there. This isn't worth burning your house down for. I got a bunch of leftover cinder blocks, so I took some of them, made this little stand just to set the forge on. This takes up less space, less tippy, nice solid base, nothing combustible on here. Not a bad way to go. Looks like you can buy cinder blocks for about $3 a piece. There's eight of them. So that's $24 for the cinder blocks if you're looking to do something like this. Of course, that might throw you over the $500 budget. But use your imagination and you might be able to scrounge some old cinder blocks or something else that's suitable. One way or another, you should be able to do this without spending a lot of money on it. And as an added bonus, by stacking them sideways, I've got all these little cubby holes that I can put things like tongs in and store some tools right there in the cinder blocks. Now that we've looked at what that $500 budget might buy in the way of tools and materials, let's look at how you might actually put some of this to work. The first thing to do is learn basic skills. One of the most basic skills in blacksmithing is drawing material out, making it longer and skinnier. And a great way to practice that is making hooks. You can take this 3 8 round bar, draw it out square, then shape the square in an octagon by knocking the corners off, then round that up and make a nice little round taper. And this is something you can do with some of that first piece of 3 8 round bar that we're going to use just as learning material. If you get good usable products that you can later sell, that's wonderful, but that's not necessarily the expectation. That piece of material is to develop skills with. If you cut it six inches long, it gives you 40 pieces of material. Although I've got plans for a little bit of it and maybe we won't use all of that to cut into that size. But it should be enough to develop this technique. If you're having trouble and things aren't going even, think about why. Adjust your technique and try to make every single taper a little bit better. My plan is to turn all these into a simple J-hook. And if you do a good job of them, that's something you'll be able to sell. Those are really popular. They aren't high-priced items, so they've got a big market of people who might be willing to buy those. 
Now we're going to talk about the marketing and all that in the next video. This video is really about getting all the tools and the equipment set up. So we'll talk about the exact product, making the product, how you get that out for sale and where you might be able to sell it. All of that kind of stuff in another video. Although I will go ahead and go through and make one or two hooks. And when we get to that next video, I will offer some variations. Maybe you can use a little bit less material and get more finished product out of one bar of steel. Maybe we do a flat taper on some of them. The ends that you're going to attach to the wall might be different on some of them. There will just be a lot of different things. So we're going to look at all that in the next video. But if you're eager to get started today, cut out 10 or 20 of these. Just practice drawing that taper. Try to make them all exactly the same. Try and make them clean and round. If you need to, you can put this in the vise, take that file, and clean them up a little bit. Then we'll worry about the other end later. So I'm going to go ahead and light the forge, get it back up to heat, and I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of hooks. Maybe I'll do one with the round taper, one with a flat taper, just so you can see what some of the options are. Finish up the end a little bit. We'll worry about holes, finish, fasteners, all of that kind of stuff in the next video. This anvil would benefit greatly from a much heavier and larger base to make it more stable.
I'm attempting this weld without any flux since I really don't want to contaminate this little forge the first time I'm using it and I probably won't do much forge welding in it anyways. This looks hot enough and it feels like it wants to stick under the hammer but in the end the weld doesn't take and perhaps flux would have been a good idea.
Well, that gives that little forge a pretty good test. And it looks like it's going to do exactly what I was hoping it would for my plan to get you up and running in your journey on blacksmithing with some simple tools, simple projects. Hopefully these won't break the bank. Now the forge weld on the little bending fork was not successful and that doesn't really surprise me. I think this could have sat and soaked and built up heat for a little longer before I tried that and maybe even left this in the forge for a little bit longer. But at 6,500 feet, not all gas forgers are going to forge weld anyways. And I really don't know that it's realistic for such a simple, budget-friendly forge to reach those kind of temperatures. And that actually makes this little hand tool shop a functional little shop. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, not a lot of luxury tools, but I can get work done in here. There's a forge, there's an anvil, I've got hammers and tongs that are now dedicated to this space, little vise over on the bench. I can function in here to make simple items. So the same starting material, six inches of 3 8 round bar, that's about 10 millimeters by 150 millimeters, something like that. We ended up with three similar but different hooks. That's kind of what I have in mind here is a little bit of variety but using the same basic skill set so you can get lots of repetition on those skills and really develop the skills of drawing out and doing some basic forging. In the next part of this series I'll look at a few more variations on these hooks, some other things we can do, and we'll take that piece of S7, make at least one punch so we can punch holes in these for a screw or a bolt, and that makes this a fully functional hook at that point. And along with that, I'll go ahead and make up one of those 20-foot bars of steel into an assortment of hooks, maybe 10 each of four different styles of hooks. I won't show all that. We'll show at least one of each hook in the next videos. Talk about where online you might be able to sell the hooks and where in person you might be able to sell hooks and how I set that up. Probably have to invest a little bit more money in the screws some vinegar to strip the zinc plating off the screws and maybe some wax or some oil to oil these up so they have some kind of finish on them. In the meantime, I want to thank Viver for sending out the little single burner forge and the two burner forge, which we still need to take a closer look at. And that'll be its own video to kind of compare the single burner with the double burner forge. And maybe I'll do a little bit more testing to see if we can get those up to welding heat. I'll put links for both forges down in the video description, as well as a link for the little anvil I'm using that comes from Viver, and their 4-inch vise in case you want to buy a new vise instead of scrounging around for an old vise. I do hope you enjoyed the video and that you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.